My name is Jim Glass. I'm a PI here in CSAIL, and um, I run a group that normally mostly works on speech or language, natural language. Um, but we also have a line of research that is trying to connect uh, speech with vision. That's a lot of fun. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about uh, today. So here we go. So before I get started, I just want to acknowledge that all the work I'm talking about uh, is done by uh, students or former students in my group. These are them in, in the top row um, and also co uh, collaborations with other people at CSAIL. So Antonio Taralba and Ode Olivar, two other PIs that um, we worked with and that I'll be talking about. Um, before I, uh, well, I'll get started at a very high level. Uh, speech is actually, I think, one of the oldest fields that has been using uh, stochastic techniques for processing. It's over 40 years. Um, and nowadays, you know, there's so many different areas that use uh, machine learning, um, and we've been making tremendous advances. But um, a common way to, to do uh, the training is in a supervised fashion, where you get input output pairs of whatever ever problem that you're dealing with. And um, you have an objective function, of course, and you can, uh, you can minimize your loss and learn your parameters that way with neural models. And it's, it's quite effective. Um, but I think this is also potentially a weakness uh, because uh, the models learn exactly what you give it for training data. So they learn any biases in the training data there's always an issue with generalization. How well are you? How well prepared is the model to handle things it's never seen before? Um, ideally, what you train on is a close match to how you're going to deploy it. And if it isn't, then you have mismatch issues, which can severely degrade performance. A lot of people in speech recognition, for example, use some of these open source models, and then they complain when the performance is not nearly as good when they try to actually use it on something real. So that's a problem. You have to get into uh, adaptation or, or people talk about fine tuning uh, these days. And it can also be expensive to create the kind of data sets uh, that you want. Some, some areas, the, uh, it's very hard to get the data, uh, for example. So one challenge for everyone working in machine learning, I think, is, is thinking about how we can do uh, with less supervision. I mean, in recent years, this whole notion of self-supervised learning has become extremely popular and they've been effective as well. And that's an example um, of using raw data, not requiring so much annotated data um, to make progress in our, in our field. Uh, speech recognition uh, is, is a good example of this. Uh, the basic paradigm is over 40 years old. It was in the 1970s that people realized that if they had annotated data where a speech waveform was matched with a sequence of words that you told it what was said, then uh, during training, you really, you had the inventory of units, whether it was phonemes or characters, if you had a pronunciation dictionary, and you were told the exact order in which they occurred in the waveform. So learning parameters really became an alignment problem or what sometimes call, people called aligning uh, beads on a string. You didn't have to learn the units um, and you were told for each uh, data sample exactly what was there. But there's repercussions to this. Um, in that it was expensive to create these data sets and speech recognition English has received the bulk of the, the research attention and other major languages of the world. And uh, smaller languages have been neglected. And I'll say more about this shortly. So if we really are interested in making technology available to everyone in the world, uh, we need to think about how to learn more with less uh, supervision. And by the way, I think it should be obvious that this is how none of us learned language when we were younger. Um, in fact, it's, it's really amazing, I think, um, how humans learn language. Uh, we learn so much uh, so young 
um, this humans have been an inspiration to me. It was really one of the things that pulled me into research and speech. I was fascinated by how we would get this noisy signal, you know, continuous signal, and somehow we move from the signal to symbolic level representations and how we learn to do that without any explicit supervision was, was amazing. Um, you know, in the first uh, year of life, uh, infants learn so much about their native language. They learn the prosody. In fact, there, there's some research that talks about um, infants learning something about prosody of the mother while the mother is still pregnant. They can hear the very low frequency sounds. But, you know, by half a year, um, infants are learning about the vowels in their native language, consonants, uh, phonotactic constraints, orders that things occur in. Uh, they're starting to segment things. They're learning uh, word boundaries, um, all with very little data. Um, in contrast, the engineering um, solutions that are being developed uh, today that are very effective now are using the equivalent of years of speech. There's a, a model that came out called Whisper just this past September that used 680,000 hours of speech, annotated speech. Some of it is a little noisy annotation, but still that's 77 years of speech, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Imagine if we couldn't speak till we were 77, half the population would be dead by then. So uh, clearly humans are an existence proof of how we're able to learn with, with, with much less. And I think it's a challenge for machines to do that. And it's not just a, um, a, a, physical, um, a philosophical argument either. I think there are practical reasons as I alluded to that, um, you know, only 2% of the world's languages, less than that, have received uh, attention for things like speech recognition. Um, NVIDIA came out, there was an article earlier this week about NVIDIA working on low resource languages, and they say it's 1%. Um, whether it's 100 languages or whatever, there's six or 7,000 languages spoken in the world, 400 languages spoken by more than a million people. If we want the technology to work, uh, put a machine down some, somewhere in the world where the local dialect or whatever, uh, have the machine acquire that, it needs to do much less learning. And I've been talking this, uh, it's actually 10 years since I wrote, first wrote this article um, uh, talking about the state of technology in, in the speech recognition field. And I outlined a number of different ways that we could make the problem harder, starting in the upper left from where we were at that time to just having matching speech and text, which we sort of do mostly now, to having independent speech and text from the same language. What if you had audio, and but your text came from the web or something like that, and you didn't have this alignment? To the last thing, which I considered the hardest, which is, well, what if you didn't have text at all, but you had other modalities, for example, like vision? And the motivation for that was, again, um, infants being exposed to the world, different uh, percepts of the world, different modalities. We see things, we hear things, people talk to us, and somehow we acquire language that way. So this motivated a line of research that we've been doing for a few years now that I want to talk about uh, more. So I'm going to talk about uh, several things depending on the time. I'm supposed to wind up at 12.30, is that right? So I'll start out talking about things we've been able to do to learn uh, correspondences between speech and visual input. Um, and then I'll talk about how we've applied this to um, another language. Um, how we've actually shown that you can learn to speak without words uh, using this technique. And I'll talk about some recent work we're doing with video, moving beyond still images to, to uh, video sequences and, and moving away from requiring speech, people to talk about images to just using the audio that's in a video to learn about language that way. And the motivation for this is uh, this is a video, little video clip that Antonio Taralba found that I like, which is somebody reading a little book to an infant. And if you think about, you know, how 
I don't know if any of you have the experience of reading a picture book to a child where you show them pictures and then you talk about it, you know, not very um, scripted or anything, but somehow we see things, we hear things and we make the association. So let me see if this plays. In the summer, I like to lie in the sun and watch the birds. And I like to watch the frogs in the pond. Then I curl up in my hollow tree and dream about spring. The end. Okay, so we wanted to do a little simple approximation to that scenario where we would show the, the model things and we would let them hear things and we would want it to learn automatically to make correspondences sort of like this image here. And we felt that if it could learn to make the link between the two modalities that it would learn something about language. It would learn about words or maybe subword units uh, from a visual point of view, it would learn about objects and it would be able, should be able to ground the two of them uh, together. That's what we were hoping. So we went away from the conventional speech paradigm that I mentioned, where you get a waveform and then you're told what words are spoken to one where we, we uh, gave people an image corresponding to each waveform. And what we did actually was we started with the image and we asked people to talk about what was in the image. Very, no other constraints other than say a couple of sentences about uh, what you see. Um, and we wanted the model to be able to learn. We figured if it could learn that these things went together, it should be able to learn which parts of the speech went with different objects. And you could imagine maybe learning an audio visual or language, spoken language, uh, visual dictionary that way, if somebody told you what the words were, or if later on, if you had text as well. So there weren't any such data sets at the time that were available, so we crowdsourced it. We used the open source uh, places uh, image data set that Antonio Taralba and his group had uh, put together, and we made a mechanical Turk task, and we put up the images, and we asked people to talk about. These are the instructions, little cooies disclaimer at the very top of the task there. Here's this is a photo of a girl standing in front of a lighthouse. The little girl is wearing a blueprint dress. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. The lighthouse in the background is white with a red roof. Okay, lots of information there. In fact, people, you know, there's a lot of work in uh, the task of image captioning where there's data sets where there's images and then people have typed um, what's going on. But it turns out these spoken captions are typically much longer more than twice as long on average with much more information because it's just so much easier for people to talk about something than they have to type it in. We've developed a number of different models sort of increasingly sophisticated as, as time went on, but all of them had this basic architecture of a uh, model that was scanning over the image and another uh, branch of the model that was scanning over the audio. And they would, both, um, they were both convolutional in nature at the time, although we've done some things with transformers as well, but they both produce a high dimensional embedding vector. In this case, 1024 dimensions. Initially, we were computing a single embedding vector for the audio clip and the visual clip. And then subsequently we developed, uh, we had a grid uh, formation on the, um, the image. So it eventually got re reduced to a seven by seven uh, grid with a 1024 embedding vector at each uh, grid point. And likewise, we had a, a down sampling on the waveform. So over 20 second clip, we produce 128 uh, 1024 dimensional uh, vectors. And what we were trying to do when it was a matched pair was compute the similarity between um, the visual branch and the um, audio branch. And um, you can imagine if you're using something like dot product or cosine similarity between the different embedding vectors, you can produce a three-dimensional tensor to capture the similarity between the seven by seven by 1024 and the 128 by 1024. And that's visualized over here on the right uh, actually, 
Can you see my mouse on the Zoom call? Okay. Um, so this is this is the three dimensional tensor here. It has the two dimensions corresponding, sort of the the x and y corresponding to the uh, visual dimensions, and then the time dimension um, horizontally there. And in this picture, uh, red indicates a region of high similarity. So at a particular point in time with a particular cell in the image, if it's a high similarity, it's darker red. And you can see here in the train model that there are these red blobs and those correspond to uh, sort of regions in the image that match at a particular point in time. Now that's a three-dimensional uh, representation. Here's another uh, version of this three-dimensional tensor. And we wanted to reduce this down to a single number to produce a loss. And we explored a number of different ones, but one of them was we could find the maximum similarity in the image <clears throat> in any of the seven by seven um, uh, grid representations to every point in time. Um, and the idea there that is that if somebody's talking about, say, the girl early on in the waveform, that that representation of the speech should match, hopefully, with the representation that's capturing part of the girl. And later on, if you're talking about the lighthouse somewhere, that vector representation from the speech should match with the vectors corresponding to the lighthouse. And if so, if you had a match, you would hope you would have a number of these high similarity regions over the course of the utterance. And we just averaged that or pooled that to come up with a single number. That's the way we, we did it for this learning paradigm. Uh, the training that we did was showing positive and negative examples. So we would take a uh, paired of a picture and a corresponding audio caption. And we would try it, the model would try and make those, um, the similarity be as high as possible. And then we would show it negative examples for the, for the, mat, for the um, motorcycle picture, we would show it some other audio caption and we would want to make those as dissimilar as possible. And likewise, for the correct audio caption, we'd show it an imposter picture and try to make the, it would try to make that as dissimilar as possible. So it was being shown positive and negative examples, and that was the mechanism by which it um, learned. Um, this was done in the mini batch or in the batch of samples that that were being used to train for some anchor uh, pair, and we'd have a, a set of um, other paired items in the batch, and we would just initially just randomly selected uh, something. Uh, from that to give us uh, negative examples. One of the things we, we realized though, was that if you just chose it randomly, you could do a little bit better by picking something that was hard, uh, but not too hard. We call that um, semi-hard negative mining. Uh, the idea there is that um, if you pick it randomly, you might pick something that's too easy to discriminate from the matched pair. But if you pick the thing that was hardest, um, that was very similar to the um, audio from your batch, for example, if the anchor pair was a, had a white car in it and somebody was talking about a white car and there happened to be another white car in the batch just randomly, then that might be too hard for the model to effectively learn. So we found that if we picked an example that was hard but not not closer than the correct pair in the distance space, um, that that worked pretty well. Um, another thing that we found worked well was using other sorts of uh, data to help pre-train the model. So there are video data sets uh, uh, from Flickr um, and others, uh, for example, that contain all sorts of random videos with not speech necessarily, but audio. So you could have video at the racetrack or waterfall or things like that. And we found that we could pre-train our models um, 
and do um, do with the same training mechanism, um, and then fine tune it on the uh, spoken captions uh, recordings that we made. We made about four hundred thousand of them for English, but you can get a lot more data from other data sets. And so this was a helpful method um, as well, which surprised us because we didn't think that general audio would be, you know, in the same space as speech at all. But I think it helped get the parameters in a reasonable space that could then be fine tuned um, on speech. To evaluate the model, um, we performed retrieval tasks, just like how people doing image captioning uh, do, where we would take a pool of a thousand. Um, uh, test cases that had never been seen before. And we would do image retrieval by pulling out an audio caption and asking the model to find the um, corresponding image. And the opposite, which is we take an image from the test set and ask the model to retrieve the correct speech uh, waveform. Um, and then we would, we would report recall at 10, meaning what's the probability that the correct result was in the top 10 choices. Um, and we did a number of experiments. Um, if you, just for uh, a week baseline, the recall at 10 of random choice is, is 1% here. Um, when we trained up a model using ImageNet training and used the speech recognition text on the spoken captions, which was admittedly imperfect, we got about 60% recall at 10 for both the speech and the image retrieval. Um, our initial model that was completely trained from scratch, about 30%, then more sophisticated models that had that uh, negative mining and that added in the pre-training with the uh, SoundNet um, videos did better. When we actually introduced some internal uh, quantization uh, layers that I'll talk about shortly, it did even better. And so we continue to progress in this task, but you can see we're doing quite well. I think we're the best results on this task now are up around 90% uh, recall at um, 10. So, so we're doing pretty good. Um, here's a little visualization of the way the similarity looks when you first start the model in an initialized fashion the similarity is evenly distributed throughout the entire tensor space. Um, and then as you go through different training epochs, you can see that it, it slowly converges to these blobs that sort of correspond to matching between the, um, the image and the, uh, and the speech. Another thing that you can do to visualize it is to go back over the original anchor, um, the speech caption, wonder what that vibrating is, um, and show as you play the speech caption where the model thinks you're talking about. So it's sort of like shining a flashlight on an image while somebody's talking about it. So you'll see the white um, blobs corresponding to this. So let me play this. This is a photo of a girl standing in front of a lighthouse. The little girl is wearing a blueprint dress. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. The lighthouse in the background is white with a red roof. Okay, so you can sort of see there that there are concepts that it's clearly um, understanding. Here, here's another one. A view of a very tall mountain or volcano with snow on the top with a lush green field with red flowers in it. Here we see a stretch of grass and a small road leading up to a very old ancient ruin. A white and blue jet airliner near trees at the base of a low mountain. So when you look at the alignment, you know, between the image and the um, audio, you can sort of see that there are definite segments in the audio that are corresponding to blobs. And we've tried a number of different ways to sort of assess what the model's learning, how word-like they are, or how, how much they're like um, phonetic units. And one of the first things we did was we tried a simple clustering approach where for each matched pair, we would try to find the top 10 um, patches in the image 
and segments in the audio that had the highest similarity. And then we'd throw them into a big pot. We would go through all the data and do this. And then we would just do k-means clustering on the audio um, uh, uh, segments that were put into the pot and the video uh, patches use, using the vector representation of each of them. And once we did that, we had these clusters in the visual domain and in the audio domain, and we could make links between them based on knowing what the underlying uh, pair matches uh, were. And let me just play you some examples. This is um, what you're seeing are nine um, visual examples from the visual cluster, and I'll play you three audio examples from the corresponding audio cluster. Castle. The castle had the castle. On the couch, brown couch, and a couch. The sunset. The sunset. Sunset. The train. The train. The train. The wooden. 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 The lighthouse. The lighthouse. A lighthouse. And there's lots of these clusters, and I'm not going to play them all, but you can see they tend to be objects. There are some colors that are learned. They tend to be. Um, so there's no actions that are learned and they're all outdoor things or they're all things that you see in the images anyway. So they're visual things, which totally uh, make sense. But, you know, you can see there's a wide uh, range of them here. So I mentioned that we um, actually modified the, the residual network model to, to introduce some quantization layers at different uh, stages in the model. And we wanted to see if, these VQ layers might be forced to learn something about the phonetic units in the language or maybe word-like units in the language. So we introduced a couple um, here and, and retrained the model. And then we can get into uh, looking at the distribution of words corresponding to code words. Now, I don't expect you to be able to see this very much, but this is just showing for example, code word number 58 corresponded very strongly with the word baseball. It had an F1 score of over 90. So the precision and the recall um, of uh, the word baseball or, or that was in that code word was very high. And this goes all the way down here, the top 200. And you can see the F1 score decreases down into the mid 60s, but still it indicates that we're capturing a lot of these um, physical words. And the, the model easily captures, uh, we were finding uh, 250 or, or 300 words. Um, it was finding over 50% um, precision. So that was encouraging. And we're continuing these lines of investigation um, now. But I wanna keep an eye on the time and switch to something uh, a little different. Uh, and that this is sort of multilingual processing because it crossed our mind that we could actually use the image as a kind of interlingua or matching between different languages. Conventional machine translation has required pairs of language for each sentence, uh, language A, language B, uh, for all the sentences that you have in your training data. And that's extremely expensive to do. If you imagine doing 6,000 languages in the world, that's a big um, number and it just doesn't exist, which is why uh, much of the translation work seems to involve English um, again. But we thought that if we had shared pictures or maybe if we didn't have shared pictures, but we had shared you know, the notion of images and had people talk about images in language A and people talk about images in language B, if it was the same image, it wouldn't be a perfect match like it would be in machine translation, but they should have something in common that might allow you to go between the two different languages. So we've looked at a couple of languages, looked at Hindi and uh, looked at Japanese uh, the Hindi work, uh, we were able to collect 100,000 captions by deploying this AMT task um, in uh, India. And here's an example. 
सामने काफी सारा समुद्र का पानी And really I think you could do I mean I could imagine if you had an app or something you could do this for any language anywhere in the world and collect data um, that way um we can do this multilingual grounding by just modifying the basic paradigm to not only include english caption and image but also the hindi caption so you have a a triple if you have a shared uh image and you can try to pull the um representations of the matched pair together and push away imposters just like you did before um and we did a number of different experiments uh one of the things that's interesting this is with a smaller training set so the numbers are a little bit lower because we didn't have we as i said we only had a hundred thousand um um images for, or captions from hindi but if you look at the performance of the monolingual system in blue and the bilingually trained system in orange you can see that in all tasks going from English caption to image or image to English caption, Hindi caption to image, uh, image to Hindi caption, you do better with more data from different languages. So clearly we're learning by the addition of data from different languages. It turns out you can even do cross language retrieval um, in this fashion as well. The um, you have the pairs for the match for the common images. You have the matched English and Hindi caption, and the blue bars show that if you just train on the speech, you can actually do retrieval from one language to another. But if you add the images uh, in orange, the uh, result is uh, significantly better in both cases. So having the visual component is clearly uh, beneficial. Um, so if you look. After you do this training, if you look at the um, relationship between two matched pairs talking about the same image. So on the Y axis, we have the English speech on the X axis, we have the Hindi speech. And in the middle, we have this heat map, which is showing similarity between the embedding vectors computed uh, for each of them through the model. So you you find these high regions of similarity. So in the upper left, there's a there's a red region, and if when you look, it turns out that it's the region where the Hindi and the English um, speakers are talking about the same object. So there's a couple of them here in this example. I don't think I have the audio um, for this. And if you do the translation, it turns out they're talking about the beach for a little bit and the mountain um, a little bit as well. You can push this a little farther by trying to actually learn a bilingual um, lexicon. And actually it's an audio visual lexicon too. We went through all the matched pairs and we found these regions of maximum similarity between the two languages. And as before, we pulled out the vector representations corresponding to them. And then we can cluster um, all of these uh, vectors in each language and then make the links between the two different languages uh, to link the clusters. And when you do that, you find that um, there is good correspondences between the objects that you're learning in English and the objects that you're learning in Hindi. So here are some examples here. I'll play you some three English examples from a cluster, three Hindi examples from a cluster. And you can also see what the model is paying attention to in visual examples of that cluster as well. Four people are- There are many people say, and some people- So this is apparently people or the people. Small green tree. Bunch of trees. With green trees. Top of a body of water. A picture of water and love a lake. It's interesting there. You see some of the one of the English speakers said lake instead of water. And this is showing that the, the model is really representing things at a semantic level. So those words, even though they're different at the surface level, are getting mapped to the same place in the embedding space.
and playing a guitar beat and a guitar on a and holding a guitar guitar industrial kitchen small kitchen in in a kitchen a kitchen ki tasveer ye khoobsurat kitchen ye khoobsurat kitchen ki an old woman wearing two women pose of a woman painting bahut sare aurte dikhai de rahe hain ek railway platform pe deti hui dikhai deti hai so it's not perfect but you can sort of see we're starting to learn the correspondences between the languages and the visual representation um all without any explicit alignment um okay another thing i can mention that's a lot of fun is we realize that if you can represent speech as a sequence of discrete units that they don't have to be words you can actually learn a model that takes those units and turns around and generates speech again and so we took the audio visual model that was learning uh discretized uh units and we could then represent any waveform as a sequence of the vq code words and then we took a common um or a popular um image captioning model um and uh show attend and tell and we created a data set that um we took the ms coco data set and we recorded the text captions had people record them so we had a speech version so we could take each speech waveform in the ms coco data set and convert it to a sequence of these vq units and then we could take the show attend and tell model and train it on these units so they could take any image and generate a set of these units and then we took a uh a deep learning uh, text to speech model um and again we could take the speech and in the data set and um convert it to a sequence of the units and we could train it up to take these units and generate a speech waveform for it Now this is not ideal because we're training all of these components independently and putting them together but I think it shows you the potential for the type of things we could pretty do we could do here because remember when humans are learning speech we're learning to talk at the same time that's part of the learning uh process so here are some examples of images that the models never seen before and it's going to take the um image caption generator but generate the sequence of the discrete units and then turn around and convert those into speech and I'll play these so starting from the upper left a small airplane sitting on the grass okay that sort of is okay the man riding skis down the smelly slope so you can hear there's a speech error smelly slope that's it's close it's got some errors a plastic tray with frites sitting on top frites the man sitting at table eating pizza so he's not eating pizza i think he's taking a picture but a parking meter on the side of the road a couple of cars sitting on the side of the street the man riding the weight on the surfboard it's not bad the man standing on the tennis court not quite that so maybe where a video would help the large red bus on the side of the road a couple of cows standing in the grass so some things is doing okay some things need more work but it shows you there that this is a scenario where it's learning how to talk without any words anywhere in in the system um here's a, just a couple more that's also showing what the model is paying attention to a man sitting on motorcycle on the side of road a bird sitting on a tree branch so i don't really get too much from that attention it just sort of seemed kind of random but um that's something that would be nice to get working uh, better so the last thing i'll mention uh briefly is that um in the past um couple of years we've been trying to look at what we can do with video 
because all of the experiments I've talked about up until now require collecting speech of somebody talking about a picture. And that's more data collection. But in video in the wild, um, you potentially have people talking while they're doing something in the video. So there's a lot of um, how-to videos like this cooking video on the right that we can potentially leverage to uh, learn about language that way. We also looked at a uh, data set that Ode Oliva and her uh, group uh, created called Moments in Time, which are short, um, I think three second uh, video clips. And we actually worked with them to create spoken, to collect spoken descriptions of these videos as well. So we've used that. Um, so as I said, in the past couple of years, uh, there's been these large data sets that have become publicly available, um, like you cook two for cooking videos and, and how to uh, 100 million. And now there's other ones like the, the ego four data sets of, of people going around uh, doing things with a camera on. Um, the learning scenario that we're using is very similar to what we were doing for the still image, except now it, you know, the speech is the same, but now we have a sequence of frames uh, for the, the video, but we're trying to learn this shared uh, multimodal embedding space, sort of capturing information at the semantic level. Um, one of the models that we uh, developed was uh, done by a student um, in my group, Andrew Rudachenko, um, that had uh, two branches, the video and the audio that I mentioned, again, use this contrastive learning scenario with, with uh, matched pairs and mismatched pairs to try and um, learn. It could also potentially incorporate any text that you had um, as well as part of the um, embedding space. Let me show you a um, example. The, so the, the test scenario here was similar in that we, we would have a batch, a test set of um, audio captions from the video um, and little 10 second video clips in the test set. And given the audio um, caption, we'd have to try and retrieve the, the correct video clip. The text is there purely so you can see what was said. We didn't use the text in this. Uh, so first you're going to see the audio, and then you're going to see the top five recalled videos play. Divine. All right, so here's my flour mixture. I'm just going to add in some salt and some black pepper. You got to have black pepper. Mm, yes, yes, yes. Lots of black pepper and some celery salt, just like. Okay, and then those are the corresponding top clips. It turns out in this case that the, the first choice was actually the correct one that we retrieved. Okay, so it's the same type of scenario, but now you're dealing with moving um, images. Um, another uh, work that was done uh, by my student, Alex Liu, um, and this was some collaboration with Ode Oliva and her, her um, student, um, tried to learn an internal discrete representation that was shared between the audio and the visual modality. And the idea, again, similar to what we did before by adding the VQ layer, except here, we wanted the, the visual stream to use the same code book and have them, have them be shared. And the idea is that this would allow us to learn common semantic objects across the audio and the, the uh, visual uh, domain. So uh, I won't go into details in the model. The, the paper is here and you can ask me more questions about it if you um, are interested, but in, in the, um, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna move on. But once you train this model, and this was trained on the spoken moments in time uh, data set, you can actually see what types of things these code words are learning. And this is a plot of I think the top 20 um, most frequent terms that were used in the moments in time data set and um, the top most frequently used 100 uh, VQ code words. And again, it's a heat map. So it's showing you which code words are used most frequently. Um, the top one is 
corresponding to the visual domain and the bottom one is corresponding to the audio domain. And you can see, well, maybe you can't see, but the top term, for example, is paddling. Um, so if the object had something to do with paddling, it would have that label. And the image or the video corresponding to paddling tended to use the same code books as the audio um, uh, caption did. And you can see that the profile of the code word use is very similar between the two. And that means that they're both learning something semantics about these action um, words, which is encouraging. Another way to visualize this is to show examples. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the audio here, but the upper left, um, the caption, someone saying a man juggling and laughing and amusement and the red corresponds to what the model is paying attention to. So you see that sort of in the visual uh, domain, it has this blob in the middle of the picture, but in the audio domain, it's definitely focusing on the word juggling. Likewise, in the bottom right, it's a young boy behind a drum set being taught as part of the caption. And the red is maybe a little bit on the drums. It's moves, of course, as a function of time, but the audio is clearly focused on the drum set. So it's encouraging that these models are, are able to learn these types of things. So that's sort of a, a brief overview of the types of things we're doing in audiovisual language learning. I think these types of ideas are important to try and you know, get machines to learn more about language um, on their own. It's clear that adding the visual modality is really helpful for learning. And this is something that we continue to actively pursue. I think in addition to, for example, the speech, you also have the background sounds that are being made. So for example, when somebody's cutting up a vegetable, you hear the chopping noise or when they're frying something, you hear that. So you hear stuff, you see stuff and you hear people talk about it. Those all go together. One day, maybe we'll even add the smell sense or if it was a robot, they could add touch, but we're, we're just doing audio and visual right now. Um, I think there's potential. I've talked, I've shown examples of words. We've also looked at subword units like phones and we're actively working on trying to acquire grammar from grounded uh, speech this way. And I think ultimately there's potential for machine translation as we've sort of shown a little bit, all under the, the, the sort of the grand challenge of trying to get a computer to learn language more on its own. So thanks for your attention and uh, happy to take any questions. So Matt can monitor the chat, and but if anybody here has a question, please let me know. So yeah. Uh, so how do you think your models are from the model that you are showing from? Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Of course. Uh, no. Uh, uh, very interesting work. Uh, so I'm curious how different your models are from say the diffusion models, you know, all these <laughs> uh, models that are being, uh, getting a lot of media coverages, uh, which are also uh, learned from, you know, un, uh, basically unleveled data, Yeah. right? Yeah, I think, I, I think it's a, a really uh, amazing time with all these different approaches. I think my primary interest is in learning speech, but they're, I think, you know, they're all trying to learn with very weak forms of supervision. So yeah. I think it's an extremely active area. So especially between vision and general audio, um, we're focusing on the speech side of things a little bit more. But um, yeah, I, I have not tried any diffusion models on any of this data yet, but I'm sure somebody will want to do that. <laughs> There'll be an archive paper out tomorrow. <laughs> we do have uh, one question um, from the virtual audience. Is there any way to use goals? Goals? That's what they... G-O-A-L-S. 
G O A O S. Yeah. Um. So that's a good question. I think I'm not sure exactly what angle the 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 question is getting at, but you know, a lot of times when people are trying to learn language, we're trying to accomplish a goal. Trying to you know, people are trying to speak to to get something um, or whatever, or communicate with another person that way. Um, or likewise, if somebody's speaking to us when we're little, maybe we're trying to teach him something. So there isn't that type of um, input in any of the data that we have here. And this is why this is a, a poor approximation to exactly what's going on with humans, but it was a place that we started. Um, and it's interesting to see what we can learn. I think another angle um, that's potentially interesting here is curriculum-based learning, where you start with things that are maybe easier and then build up um, beyond that. But there isn't anything goal-oriented here, other than saying that these two things go together. Thanks, that's what I was asking, so. Um, you mentioned that this isn't the way humans learn, but systems like Alpha, Go are, are self-supervised and can reach superhuman levels of performance. Um, are we so data starved that this won't be possible in this domain? No, I'm not sure of anything. But I will say that, you know, this working in this field for so long has always kept me very humble because humans are really amazing at understanding and, and recognizing speech in very challenging situations. I think there's been tremendous advances in the field over the last decade. And um, I don't, you know, I don't know where things are gonna go. Things will continue to improve. And one day it would be nice if we could put a machine down everywhere on the planet, maybe a, a little cluster of robots that communicate with each other and they interact with people to learn the local languages um, and then ultimately learn how to translate between them. I think that would be amazing. I don't know how long it's gonna take us to get there, but I think that's a challenge. Thank you. Um, just one more question, um, if you have time, Jim. Did you do any ablation studies to see how much of an impact negative training or slash using negative examples had versus just training with positive examples? Initially, the model wouldn't learn without the negative examples. I mean, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of different approaches um, to contrastive learning um, uh, since then, and some of the students have been trying them, but typically um, we're doing some sort of contrast with positive and negative things. Um, so, I mean, the, the alternatives to try some kind of reconstruction loss or something like that, but we haven't applied any of that um, here. My postdoc, Yuan, has tried some stuff with learning audio, but we haven't applied it to speech and vision yet. <laughs>